Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and well, we're about one week away from Meta Connect, and for the first time in a couple of years, I'll be there in person covering the event. Uh, we all expect for Meta to announce the Quest 3, uh, though what that headset will be still to be announced and determined, although I expect it to probably be similar to the Quest 2 and the Quest Pro and that it'll be a standalone VR headset. I'll have hardware uh, built internally and a battery to run games locally from the Quest Store, as well as the ability, of course, probably to tether still to your PC to play native uh, Steam VR games or Quest games, games through that library uh, over Link or Air Link. And while I love my Quest Pro and I love specifically the optics in it, uh, I think this is still an insufficient device for a community of dedicated hardcore PC VR gamers out there. Uh, and there are a lot of you, a lot of us out there. So today I wanted to talk about two headsets that address the PC VR gaming needs. And that's the need to have the best visual fidelity possible, not only tapping into the full power of a dedicated graphics card, whether plugging into a high-end gaming laptop or you know, your 3000 and 4000 series NVIDIA card, DisplayPort plug into, right into your uh, gaming PC, uh, but also having uh, the best panels uh, for the best resolution, the best angular resolution in headset to have those imperceptible pixels and get rid of screen door effect completely. The Quest Pro doesn't do that. No standalone VR headset does that yet, that's still in the realm of the dedicated PC VR space. And so the two headsets I have in front of me have that shared goal of the most immersive, the best visual fidelity of a VR experience, of a PC VR experience, but tackle them with completely different approaches. I'm of course talking about the big screen Beyond, which just started shipping last week. Congratulations to that big screen team. Uh, and the Pimax Crystal, this headset here, uh, which Pimax has been shipping to its backers over the past couple months and updating its software and even some of the hardware. Actually, on both these devices, we've seen some updates. You can tell they're vastly different devices. Their differences also very interesting. Um, in terms of their approaches, not only to the panels, but the, their just design philosophies, what they're going for. Um, let's start with Big Screen Beyond, because I've talked a lot about this headset. I've previewed it. I was able to spend a lot of time with a pre-production unit. And my thoughts on this remain largely the same. You know, The bottom line is, this is a $1,000 VDR headset that piggybacks off of a theoretically existing hardware you may have. If you invest it in a Valve Index and you're in that lighthouse tracked ecosystem, you have base stations, you have the Knuckles controllers, uh, this will work right out of the box with that. Uh, if you don't have that, you'll need to buy those accessories because there's no inside out tracking here. There's no controllers that come with this. The $1,000 you're spending is essentially for the display. You're spending it, think of this as a, you know the VR equivalent of buying a high-end gaming monitor. You still gotta buy your accessories uh, to run that. But what a gaming monitor, what a display this is. So to recap, it's uh, two micro OLED panels, 2560 by 2560 resolution per eye, uh, and with their own custom pancake optics, now with a uh, pixels per degree, an angular resolution of 31 pixels per degree when you're looking right down the center at the sweet spot and the center of the panel and lenses. Um, Compared to your Quest Pro, Quest 2, those are still in the 20s in terms of pixels per degree. No one's using micro OLED panels except for big screen in the big screen beyond and Apple's Vision Pro, but that won't be shipping next year. And that's an even higher resolution panel. That's a whole different category of device uh, in the standalone headset because that's locked into Apple's ecosystem. And we don't even know if that's gonna, that would work with PC VR at this point. My assumption is no, but it's not just the type of panel and the resolution that big screen's going for, it's also form factor. And this is by far the lightest VR headset I have ever used. Without this gasket, the facial interface, which we'll talk about, 127 grams. So the comparison I like to give is that this is lighter than a Quest 2 controller with the battery inside. If you have that, 
pick that up. That's how light this headset is. Combined with the head strap, the soft head strap, and the face gasket, it goes up to about 185 grams max. Mine is about 180 grams because everyone's going to have a different weighted facial interface because it's actually carved to your face. So as you recall, you, uh, to get this manufactured, you have to use an iOS device with the Face ID sensor. You can run it out of Apple Store. They'll send you an email uh, with a web applet link. You open that up and in under five minutes, you've scanned your face, you've sent that geometry over to big screen and through their custom manufacturing, they will mill out this silicone uh, the silicone gasket, which has magnetic attachment. So actually a little bit of plastic inside here as well. That just easily snaps onto the headset and it perfectly conforms to your face. So whether it's the full headset or just the gasket itself, the surface area, the amount of contact it's making with your face is such that you're not only getting no light bleed at all, is a complete light seal on here, uh, but also even with this relatively small rectangle, uh, it's enough to support the headset, uh, this 127 grams in front of your face, so that it you don't basically feel the headset at all. It's an incredibly different experience than you know wearing a uh, PSVR 2, uh, Quest Pro, even the, the Quest 2 with the Elite head strap. This with the soft headband, the soft head strap is really all you need uh, for this to feel comfortable. I actually don't even like to have it tightened. I actually just like to have it secure uh, so it just rests on my face. And I'm in VR for then hours at a time. It's the only headset I can say that I've been comfortably been able to watch a full two to three hour movie and not feel the burden of the headset of wearing, uh, you know, basically displays and lenses and plastic on my face. Now, since I last previewed this, Big Screen has addressed some of the issues I had with it. Not all of them, but let's talk about what's changed. Uh, there's a whole new optic system that they actually announced a couple months ago that they were able to implement and get manufactured for the shipping units. And so while the uh, preview units I had had a field of view of roughly 90, degree, 90 degrees, uh, the latest optics here have a horizontal field of view of 102 degrees. And I was able to go do some A-B testing with that preview pre-production unit and this now shipping unit, and it is a noticeable difference, that extra 10, 12 degrees um, on uh, total on uh, your left and right on your periphery. Uh, that's the difference between, I don't think maybe so in games, when I'm playing a game, 90 degrees I feel like is sufficient when I'm just immersed in the action in front of me. Uh, where I felt like it made the biggest difference was watching media. So if I'm in a virtual cinema environment, uh, like a big screen environment, you know, and I'm in a grand cinema, I'm in my favorite seat, the seat I would pick if I was booking a seat in the local Dolby Theater, and I'm watching a giant screen, no longer do I have to actually turn my head to see the edges of that screen. It actually fills my entire field of view and allows me to watch whether it's Disney Plus shows or movies off my computer. You know, if you have 4K movie files at high bit rate, it's such an enjoyable experience to watch this in a big screen beyond in a big screen virtual environment or just a floating image if you're using something like virtual desktop. Uh, that's a vast improvement and my understanding is it wasn't easy. So one of the things I'm curious about is what compromises do they have to make to get that extra field of view. Uh, and again, doing those A-B test comparisons, uh, the sweet spot seems exactly the same, which is to say that when you're looking to the edges, if you're moving your eyes around, uh, it does fade off in clarity at the end, but fades off in clarity at the edges pretty similarly between the two, uh, the two versions. Uh, and I didn't notice any additional pupil swim at all or any kind of distortions. Uh, you do have the still similarly the same amount of glare that I saw in the earlier units, um, which the, is unavoidable, they say, with the amount of polarization that they have to do and the kind of the, their optic stack. Uh, and I still would best describe that as something that's like kind of like having smudgy glasses. It's, I think, 
pretty noticeable um, in high contrast scenes. So watching a movie like 1917, where the protagonist is running through that pitch black city and you have the flares flying out, you're gonna notice the glare. If you have a, a Valve Index, it's not as bad, I think, as some of those God Rays, but it is noticeable in this headset. Um, it, unless you're watching like a very evenly lit scene. So I watched all of Barbie, for example, in here, and Barbie is lit and, and designed as such where the scenes didn't have a ton of high contrast. Pretty bright and colorful, um, and so the glare is much less noticeable watching a movie like that. Also watched uh, the latest Ahsoka episode on Disney+, Plus, and while Disney Plus streaming, is still not at 4K in big screen. Uh, if you're able to get a copy of it in 4K, it looks fantastic in a virtual cinema. And the issues of glare, while not imperceptible, uh, became something that I was happy to deal with and happy to live with because I was so immersed in the video and the content in front of me. Now this is still a tethered PC VR headset, so you do have a cable that plugs into your PC. Uh, this is a USB-C fiber optic cable. It's a pretty rigid cable, uh, and so you kind of wire it to the around the back of the head strap. The head strap very easily clicks in, and then you plug the cable in. I've learned to give the cable a little bit of slack uh, because uh, the, it's, the cable itself is so rigid where that uh, if you didn't give it the slack and you move your head around, it could actually risk separating that connection. Uh, Big Screen also has decided to include for everyone a top strap option, which I found really helpful, just taking a little bit of extra weight off. It made those, those, those cinematic experiences, those viewing durations that much more comfortable. Um, although something that they did notice, and I notice, is that some of the early batches that they shipped to users did have some weaker plastic in the back through that little uh, cable grabber here. And so in mine, it did snap off. Now, Big Screen did tell me they are proactively reaching out to those users and sending them replacement head straps. Uh, and I also found that users have since designed their own uh, cable clips that work with the head strap. And I would recommend, if you have a 3D printer, printing up a couple of these. I have these printed in PETG, and I, I really like the ones that fully cradle the cable, so I have two of those attached to the back of the head strap, so there's no wailing around, and it's really nice and secure. Uh, they're also shipping a hard strap option with built-in audio, so this doesn't have built-in audio. You're using your own earbuds, your own headphones, over-the-head ear, ear headphones, uh, but one with built-in audio option uh, will be coming, shipping by the end of the year for $100. And it's really a, bespoke headset, so it's made for you. Uh, not only is it made for your facial interface, but you also send your uh, interpupillary dif distance, your IPD, and that is not something that you can adjust after the fact. So you can actually see on the inside the actual panels here, not the lenses, but the actual panel is fitted to your IPD. So it says, for me, 68, because they have uh, 18 different units of, uh, that they can attach in for a range of between 55 millimeters at the narrowest to 72 millimeters. Although they say that users uh, as low as 53 millimeters will use this and as high as 74 millimeters can use these uh, without difficulty. Um, the gasket here is made for you. So I've tried these in other people and it's not comfortable or it doesn't work as a seal for other people. Uh, but they'll also work with users to adjust yours. So if you want, for example, uh, if you have long eyelashes and you want the face relief to be thicker, uh, they can accommodate that. Or if you want a very minimal uh, eye relief and you want to press your your pupils right against the panels, uh, they can make custom uh, face release uh, face relief uh, modules for you as well. And they are working on one that will be absorbent because this one does not absorb any sweat at all. So for fitness activities, you want something that doesn't just pull up your sweat uh, in the silicone. And so they have a generic uh, cushion that's in the works so that not only will it work for fitness, but also it's something that potentially you could also use to share the headset with your friends and family so they can see what it looks like when you have that 31 pixel per degree angular resolution on the inside. Now, everything I said about the visual fidelity of the Big Screen Beyond preview unit still holds true for now the shipping version in that that angular resolution, now 31 pixels per degree at the sweet spot, 
is a it's hard to come back from. It's hard to go back to a headset with lower pixels per degree. Games look so much better. You know, even a multi-year-old game now like Half-Life Alex, still a high bar for fidelity in the, the geometry, in the textures, and the lighting. Everything looks so much better when you have more pixels, when you can see the textures, you can read the fine print, and you can see all the detail the game designers and the artists put in that. That is, that is the reason you have a headset with this type of panel. Uh, watching media is something that I didn't fully appreciate with my uh, earlier preview unit. And I'm doing a lot more of in this review unit. And I love watching movies and high resolution, high bitrate content uh, in a virtual cinema. And it's also the case where I do notice the difference between that 75 hertz and 90 hertz. And I know since I did my preview video, there's been a lot of chatter about what the differences are in that 75 hertz mode and the 90 hertz mode. And it's true, in 90 hertz, to get a full 90 hertz mode, you have to run the, uh, the your GPU at a 1920 by 1920 uh, resolution per eye that's then upscaled. So the panels here are always running at native resolution. 2560 by 2560, but it is an upscaled image uh, to get that bandwidth over the DisplayPort 1.4 connection. Now, in games, unless you're doing an A-B comparison, unless you know for a fact, and it's not noticeable. Playing a game, running it with super sampling in Steam VR, the games are gonna look fantastic. I'm immersed in the action. Uh, the places where I did notice the difference between upscaling and the native res resolution uh, is in media, in playing specifically 4K media, high bitrate 4K media. If you have a scene where a person's filling up a giant cinema screen and you have hair, I can tell the difference between hair that's ren that's native resolution on a 4K image and hair that while looks, you can see the visual strands, isn't as sharp and it's a little smooth out when it's upscaled in the uh, upscaled version. So when I'm using this headset, I'm using the big screen desktop utility to switch between 75 hertz and 90 hertz. For games, I'm at 90 hertz. I want that extra, those extra frames, the low persistence on this, this makes this super smooth. Uh, when I'm watching video, I'm going actually down to 75 hertz. Uh, and when I'm using virtual desktop, similarly, I'm also going to 75 hertz if I'm doing any type of productivity. And this really isn't a headset for productivity. You know, I opened up my virtual desktop open up web browsers and text is readable. I can type them through a Google Doc, I can respond to emails, I can even open uh, Adobe Premiere, uh, but it's not something that I found was comfortable to actually do. And that's combined uh, a combination of factors uh, because the sweet spot on the lenses I think is still relatively small. If you're moving your eyes around, you will see a degradation in the clarity. It does get kind of blurry. You do see some chromatic aberration toward the outer edges. Uh, and also these are fixed focal length headsets. You know, we're not at verifocal yet. So the, the is optics and the stack is designed and calibrated as such where the image is at its sweet spot converged to about arm's length in front of you. And at that distance where you would want to have your virtual display, uh, the pixel density is such is that you're still doing a little bit of squinting to read that text and you're not getting the benefits of having you know, a, a massive display uh, at that high pixels per degree. Not quite there yet for productivity, incredible for media, incredible for games. And Big Screen did confirm to me that they're working on a 72 hertz mode. Yes, 72 hertz mode uh, for media because that's a even uh, integer multiplier of 24 FPS. And so if you're watching, again, a movie at 24 frames per second, running it at 72 hertz means that you won't have that misalignment in frames occasionally, uh, and you also get better uh, low persistence when you're running at that. Uh, persistence is also worth discussing because one of the criticisms I had of the preview unit was that this was not a particularly bright headset. And with that same desktop utility that you're using to change refresh rates and change potentially the, uh, also the uh, personalized your LED color, your RGB LED color on the outside of the headset, uh, you also can overclock the panel for it to be extra bright. So there's a toggle between 100% brightness and you can move that slider down to 50% brightness or 150% brightness. And that difference is also game changing for this headset. For movies, even though you may get a little bit more of that pixel smear, um, I'm not moving my head a lot. 
uh, at 75 hertz, uh, I'm bumping my headset all the way at 150% brightness. The fan does kick on at 100% speed, and if you're not listening to audio, you, it is noticeable. You can hear that fan sound, uh, but the trade-offs I think are 100% worth it. Bump that brightness up, watching a movie, watching Barbie at 150% brightness, 75 hertz, native 4K resolution, it looks better. It's more preferred for me than watching a movie on even my big screen OLED TV in my living room because it feels like I'm in a cinema. It's the first time I felt like, wow, VR cinemas can actually be a comparable replacement and a viable replacement to going to the theater. I may never be able to watch you know, Avengers Endgame in IMAX again, but to have a high bitrate 4K version of that, you can have that IMAX experience in headset. Um, and of course, big screen lets you watch movies with your friends. It's multiplayer, and so you get that social cinema experience as well. I love watching movies in this thing. So as a PC VR headset, this is my preferred PC VR headset. It is you know, the logical upgrade if you're, if you bought a Valve Index four years ago, and you have those base stations, it's a no-brainer, I think, to pick up Big Screen Beyond. No one else is using micro OLEDs. No one else is bold enough to do this type of custom gasket. I don't see anyone doing that. Uh, and if you're a sim gamer, if you uh, want to spend a lot of time, honestly, in VR, uh, this is the best way to go. Uh, which brings us to... The Pimax Crystal, and not bearing the lead, it's not a headset I like. I get what they're going for. It's the kitchen sink approach. Uh, Pimax, known for putting high resolution panels, wide field of view optics in their headsets. Uh, the Pimax Crystal is kind of the culmination of that. Now it's inside out tracking. Four cameras here, uh, they're using uh, very high resolution LCD panels, over three inches in size per eye, uh, at a resolution 2880 by 2880 per eye. And aspherical glass lenses. So remember the Vario Aero, also aspherical lenses. Love those optics, uh, but they're not as thin or light as pancake optics. And here, the glass, the glass lenses, the big LCD panels, and the fact that this actually also works as a standalone headset with a processor in here, an SOC and a battery, means that this is a heavy, heavy headset. It is 1.1 kilograms when you also have the speakers on the side here. It is the kitchen sink approach. That is six times as heavy as the big screen beyond. Now I know fundamentally completely different approaches, but by point of comparison, that is what it takes for them to get everything in here. And yes, the visual fidelity is incredible. 35 pixels per degree, clear across the entire 124 degree horizontal FOV. Uh, it is up there with that Vario Aero uh, experience. Uh, games look great, media looks great. The local dimming also works well, uh, while they're not quite as contrasty as OLEDs, um, games look incredible. The same type of visual fidelity you're gonna get, that I got in Big Screen Beyond, you're getting also here uh, in a game like Half-Life Alex. No problem. I just didn't like wearing the headset. It's so heavy, it's so cumbersome. There's a lot of ton of padding here in the back and the forehead, I could feel it. Uh, the fact that there's so much weight in front of you. Um, there's motors in here for the auto IPD adjustment. There's eye tracking, inside out tracking. Um, swing my head around, looking around, just even slowly moving my head to gaze upon a scene. The inertia, the weight of the headset had it moving around to the point where it just didn't feel comfortable. I wasn't enjoying the content because I was too worried thinking about the weight and the comfort of the ergonomics of this. The fact that it has a battery built in is a necessity for it to be a standalone, but it also needs a battery for it to run tethered to VR. That's inexcusable. They do include two batteries. This is a charging uh, a battery charger, that a sleeve that you plug your curved battery into, so it does have a hot swappable option because there's a small battery uh, local in it as well, but you actually need to have this battery charge when it's in the headset for you to even be using PC VR, because I guess 
power needs to go through that SOC as well. Uh, and when you're just using this five meter cable plugged into USB, USB and display port, the battery doesn't fully charge while you're also running the headset. So with the battery, if you can bear it, if you can wear it for that long period of time, three hours uh, before you have to hot swap the battery. And the clip design of the battery I found to be not great. It was annoying to even swap the batteries. Uh, the new units do ship with a USB hub, which doubles that battery life because it funnels more power into that battery. Um, and as of right now, when I'm recording this, the standalone VR app store for this isn't really even operational. So they've been shipping this to users for the past couple months. The software's changed, the firmware's been updated numerous times, and even the packaging, what's come in the box has changed to accommodate all these quirks and things that people have had to deal with using the Pimax Crystal. You know, it has controllers that are basically aesthetically very similar to your Quest 2 controllers. Um, they feel flimsier, uh, you know, it, they're very lightweight, they track okay, you get the same kind of field of view issues if you're doing, uh, as, uh, for tracking because of the inside out aspect of this, uh, but there will be a, a lighthouse faceplate to improve tracking if you want to use that as accessory to graft into the front of this, so you can also then use your knuckles controllers or your, you know, whatever uh, lighthouse, uh, Steam VR controllers that you may have. But, it's a really a tale of two, two headsets. Um, I don't believe the kitchen, approach, kitchen sink approach is right uh, going forward. I think that even for people, uh, dedicated PC VR users who want, who want that field of view, who want that PPD, probably aren't in it to do standalone VR. You know, there's a world, and I can imagine, that where Pimax takes that design, which I think is sound, for their LCD panel, their glass aspherical lenses, um, and do a manual IPD adjustment. I don't think it necessarily needs uh, your eye tracking um, and make something that's just not 1.1 kilograms. Uh, they don't need to go down to 185 grams. That's a very specific niche approach, niche approach to uh, VR headset design, um, but I don't think this is right. They, they need to rethink their approach, uh, especially if they're planning on packing a 12K horizontal resolution panel uh, uh, on this next year, on their next iteration. So as of today, toward the end of 2023, it's understandable that PC VR users feel neglected. I mean, the Valve Index came out so long ago, don't know what Valve's working on. Meta's fully invested in the standalone experience. Apple's headset is a standalone experience. Uh, and so there aren't many options for PC VR users who want to play their sim games, who want to do the, that type of desktop productivity, uh, who want to watch with the highest amount of uh, video with the highest amount of clarity possible. Uh, and so I'm thankful for companies like Big Screen and to some extent Pimax as well to keep on investing in that space. Uh, I think the approach is here, uh, Big Screen's on to something. I think the bespoke approach of a lightweight design uh, custom made facial interface, a headset made for a, a, the user specifically, I think it really proves the case and shows how important ergonomics are gonna be going forward for VR. We're not at the point, and, and AR, honestly, because if we wanna exist in a future where we're wearing these for immersive experiences to enter some type of metaverse or whatever gaming content or media content, uh, these getting smaller or lighter, I think, have to be uh, have to be a priority for hardware manufacturers. And even when I use the the Vision Pro, I felt the weight of that headset, and I felt the ergonomics not being as comfortable, honestly, as my experience with the big screen beyond. But if you have questions about either of these headsets or have thoughts or guesses as to what Meta might show next week at Connect, please post them in the comments section below. But until then, I'm Norm, and I will see you next time on location at Meta Connect. Bye.